Okay, so we're going to move on to the filoviridae. These are the most severe hemorrhagic diseases. Um, these are not spread by arthropods. Um, these are actually, um, honestly, they're spread by cultural practices in human um, fluids. Um, the reservoir for these is things like the fruit bat. And then transmission is human to humid. Um, it can be in blood. Um, it can be spread in semen, um, in secretions. Uh, this is, you know, a fairly infectious disease that is spread human to human. And the reason why I say secretions is actually because um, it's so hemorrhagic that there is likely blood in the secretions. Um, this is an enveloped negative sense single-stranded RNA filamentous virus. So what do I mean by filamentous? That's normally something that we associate with either um, fungal infections or some of the bacterial infections like actinomyces or nocardia. Um, well, if you look at this virus in an electron micrograph, it has what they call a shepherd's hook appearance. So it looks um, like chains, like ropes. Um, and uh, so that's why it's been called filamentous. There are actually kind of three viruses that we talk about here. Um, Ebola has two, um, Sudan and Zaire. And then um, there's Marburg, which is considered the gentler sister of this um, family, although those who have survived her would not call her gentle. Um, okay, so as I mentioned before, the reservoir is the fruit bat. Now, most people think of a bat and they think, you know, oh, you know, cute, fuzzy little bat, you know, and it's a fruit bat, so it's probably like nibbling on a banana and isn't that nice. No, this is not a cute, fuzzy little fruit bat. This is a massive beast. This is a, this is the stuff of nightmares, in my opinion. This is a big, scary, like, this is what Dracula would turn into uh, if he was real and could, like, metamorphosize into a bat. Um, the wingspan can be six feet long. Um, this is a full-grown adult human man, and this is a fruit bat. It's massive. So how do we get Ebola from things like fruit bats? Well, it's because of this. Um, this is one reason. This is bushmeat. Um, so much like in the United States, we have people who go deer hunting, right? So every fall, you'll have some guys who will set up a deer stand, maybe some ladies too, um, and they'll head out into the woods and they will look for deer to hunt. Um, and then they will butcher that deer themselves, cook it up and eat it. Um, well, in Africa, instead of hunting deer, they hunt things like antelopes and you guessed it, the fruit bat. Um, Ebola is fine in the fruit bat. Fruit bat doesn't typically die. Um, but there is no human or non-human primate reservoir for Ebola or Marburg. Um, it runs through us too quickly. But in the fruit bat, it's fine. So people go out and they shoot down or hunt this fruit bat. I can't even blame them. This is a lot of food for a family. And it's also a way to make money. They can, you know, set up um, roadside shops selling this bush meat. And in the butchering and preparation of this animal, um, they are able to contract Ebola. Um, the other way this gets spread, so at first it makes the jump from the fruit bat into us. Then what happens is we spread it from each other. And as I mentioned before, um, it's really easy to get. Um, it's in the blood. And unfortunately, this is not only a hemorrhagic fever, it is the most severe of the hemorrhagic fevers. So blood is lost at you know, an alarming rate, um, and it's in the organs, and it's in semen. So the other half of this is, you know, sexual practice, obviously, um, and then um, blood. So when someone passes, we all have cultural perspectives that um, we take on death, and it's different from every for every culture. And in Africa, one of the things that would happen often is that family members would prepare the body for burial or for after death. Um, and in doing so, especially with a hemorrhagic fever, they become exposed to the blood. Um, and so that actually uh, promotes the transmission of this virus. And that's why 
you know, in some epidemics, you'll see entire communities where Ebola has just like run through or Marburg has run through. Um, and it's a cultural thing, so it's hard to break down. Um, they won't necessarily understand or appreciate somebody from World Health coming in and wrapping their loved one in a tarp and taking them away, even if it is for their own safety. Um, so cultural shifts and burial practices have played a huge role in the epidemics that um, have happened with Ebola, including the most recent one. Um, the other reason it's spreading more effectively is basically we live in a more global community. So this picture was actually taken by a former Rush graduate, Gene Ollinger, when he was um, visiting Africa during the most recent um, outbreak. And this is actually a border crossing near Sierra Leone um, from one country to another. And this was actually during the height of the outbreak. So you can see that the road is empty and it's guarded. But he said that during non-outbreaks, this is a busy thoroughfare. This is like 290 on a work day and it would be crowded with people, um, vehicles, just going country to country. So that's one way that we basically transmit it from one place to another. Um, so what is the actual disease? Um, so the incubation period from the time you are exposed to Ebola to the actual disease is actually two to 21 days. And that's actually going to be important. So we'll talk about that a little bit more in, the, in a minute. But basically you're gonna start with fever of unknown origin. Um, and then that's going to very quickly change into a much more severe disease. So fatigue, myalgia starts, headache and sore throat. Then comes the actual hemorrhaging portion. Um, you get very severe vomiting and it's black vomit because um, it has a high content of blood. Um, diarrhea, but it's, I mean, it's mainly blood, bloody diarrhea, bloody stool, rash, um, and eventually that leads to severe hemorrhaging from both internal and external organs. Um, patients will hemorrhage from the eyes, the nose, the mouth, um, even the ears, the gums, um, basically anywhere that the blood barriers, the endothelial cells can break down. Um, these two viruses cause the most severe cases of viral hemorrhages. Um, so um, very significant um, for transmission as well, just because of what's happening here. So what can we do about it? Well, con supportive care is one thing. Rehydration, um, making sure patients have enough fluid to make their bodies work so that they don't go into shock and die uh, is really important. Um, so that's one thing that you can do to help. Um, the other thing is that there is such a thing as convalescent serum. Um, I normally talk about this um, in immunology when I'm teaching immunology. Um, in the most recent outbreak, there was a doctor, Dr. Kent Brantley, who actually contracted Ebola while he was working as an aid worker during the um, outbreak. He contracted it, he came back to the US, got some medical care, and he actually survived. And they actually took his serum and put it in a nurse in Texas who had contracted it from a patient. And the antibodies within his serum actually provided protection to the nurse while she had time to make her own antibodies. So you can use convalescent serum, um, just kind of a form of passive immunity to provide some protection. The problem is this is a highly fatal illness and you need the patient to be free of virus and you need them to have a, an adequate antibody immune response. Um, and when you know upwards of 70% of your patients are dying, that doesn't give you a high survival pool to pull antibodies from. Um, so in the last outbreak, there was actually a bit of um, a uh, benefit that was shown with ZMAP. So ZMAP is an artificially produced antibody therapy. It was actually created in part by that Rush graduate, Gene Ollinger, um, Ollinger who works for USAMRID. Um, and he worked with a team at USAMRID as well as people from Canada's National Microbiology Laboratory and Matt Bar Pharma biopharmaceuticals basically to genetically engineer tobacco plants. And these genetically engineered tobacco plants have been made so that they make antibodies that are able to transiently produce Ebola antibodies. Um, and these antibodies can then be transferred into patients and provide help. So um, these are three different monoclonal antibodies that are specific for variants of Ebola. So there have been seven 
epidemics of Ebola in human history that we're aware of. Um, the first was in 1976 in Africa, um, and it had, you know, a very significant um, fatality rate. Um, the most recent one um, a couple of years ago was actually in 2014, which ended with about 27,000 people infected and 11,000 of them died. So um, that one actually didn't have too bad a fatality rate. It only was about as high as 50%, which is uh, pretty good considering what it has been in the past. I mean, in 2001, 2002, it was you know 80% basically. So um, actually, as of May 2017, there was a new outbreak that was announced. Um, they had over a thousand Ebola cases and over 800 um, patients were reported to have died from it. Um, so an 80% fatality rate. Um, thankfully, this one they got control of very quickly. It was closed on July 2nd when the 42 day waiting period ended. So what does this mean, this 42 day waiting period? So I told you earlier that the time of incubation from the time you're exposed to when you could potentially start showing symptoms is 21 days. So your incubation period is 21 days. So the waiting period to close any epidemic is two times the incubation period, so 42 days. So currently we have no current outbreaks of Ebola um, and we were able to get out of the last one a lot cleaner than the one before it. And that is it for hemorrhagic fever viruses.